Today, I'm going to discuss what every single current UFC champion would need to do in order to become the GOAT of their weight class. What do they need to do to surpass the greatest fighter in their division's history? I've made a similar video like this 10 months ago, but since then, we've had like a ton of new champions. And I'm really interested in bringing this back, especially now that we see a guy like Volkanovski lose, and I want to compare his legacy to Teporia's, and I want to talk about what Teporia can do to pass Volk. I also want to discuss what a guy like Drikas can do to surpass the great Anderson Silva. And it will come as a surprise. I do not believe that the modern day current UFC champions need to go tit for tat, title defense for title defense in order to pass these goats, all right? In my opinion, what really matters is the caliber of your victories. And that's what we'll discuss in this video. But without further ado, let's just get into this. Starting with the featherweight division, we're gonna be comparing the featherweight goat to the current champion. Now, of course, the featherweight goat we're talking about Alexander Volkanovsky, and his resume is just pretty damn impressive, okay? Six title wins, 12 total wins in the featherweight division, only one loss, and we saw that first loss last weekend. Now, in my opinion, you know, I'll, I'll read off the notable wins that he has. He has Max Holloway three times. He has Jose Aldo, Yair Rodriguez, Brian Ortega, Chad Mendez, Darren Elkins, and TKZ. Uh, you're probably wondering why I'm bringing up Darren Elkins. He was on a five-fight win streak by the time he fought Alexander Volkanovsky and had a pretty good resume up until then. But what's most impressive about Volk is the amount of all-time wins that he has mixed in with his dominance. So, for example, when I say all-time wins, you're going to see that theme throughout this video. What I mean is guys that I would consider putting up in there in like the top 20, top 15 of all time more along the lines of top 15, an exclusive bunch. Only 15 fighters are ever going to be in that uh, conversation, and it's always changing, but right now, I still believe Jose Aldo is a top 15 fighter of all time. Volk has a win over him, and I still believe that Max Holloway, even though he might not be a top 10, he's right on the end of that 10 through 15 spot. I could have him around the 15 spot, and I think that that is very impressive that Volk beat him three times. And of course, the dominance, he's only lost four rounds in his entire career, three of them being to Max Holloway. One of them, I believe, was against Darren Elkins, and that was it. Like, of course, you can consider the Ilya Teporia round two a loss, but that's not really like a round loss. It's just you got KO'd and you lost the fight, all right? So maybe you could say five, but out of 12 or 13 fights, only losing four or five rounds when a big part of your style is to be striking, that is insane. So, Volkanovski may have some of the best quality we've ever seen on a resume, and that's why, of course, I just have him as the featherweight goat. There's no one, in my opinion, that comes that close. Ilya Teporia is the featherweight champ, so obviously he just beat the featherweight goat. But that in and of itself doesn't necessarily make you the featherweight goat. You still have some work to do. For example, Volk beating Max the first time doesn't necessarily mean that Volk passes Max. He still has to get some more wins. Max beating Aldo for the first time does not make him the featherweight goat. He still needed to beat Max again. He still needed to go and get a bunch of other wins against contenders. And the same thing goes for Connor. Beating Aldo doesn't just make Connor the featherweight goat, but it's a hell of a head start especially when, again, it's like you just beat Volkanovski, who has some of the best quality wins we've ever seen. Ilya has one title win. I'm not so concerned with title wins, as you guys will see throughout this video. I'm mostly concerned with the caliber of opponents. It is very possible to have a win that's not in a championship fight that is better than a win in a championship fight. He has six total wins in the featherweight division. The Jai Herbert fight, I'm not counting as far as featherweight goes, obviously, because it was at lightweight. Notable wins, Alexander Volkanovsky, Josh Emmett, Bryce Mitchell. You know, beating Josh Emmett, it may not be the best win in the world, but it is a notable win. That is a, a contender, a top 10 level opponent. Those are sometimes the guys that will be fighting for a title. It's on the low end of a caliber win when it comes to like a championship level fight, but it's still a notable win. Bryce Mitchell, same thing. 
one all-time win over Alexander Volkanovsky, who is arguably a top five fighter ever. And his dominance is pretty excellent, undefeated, 100% win rate. And he's only lost three rounds in his entire career at this weight class as well. So let's get on. No, maybe two. Because I think I'm counting the Jai Herbert one there. So he's lost a round to Bryce Mitchell. He's lost a round to his first ever opponent in the UFC. And he lost the first round to Volk. So that is three. Fair enough. Let's get on to what Ilya can do to pass Alexander Volkanovsky. Okay. I think that he needs four or my five more consecutive wins against top level contenders. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm saying things like I don't think these guys need to go tit for tat, defense for defense with the previous guy that was the GOAT. But in Ilya's case, he doesn't have the fortune of being able to fight a young Jose Aldo. Volk fought Aldo when Aldo was 33. According to the Aldo fans, Aldo needed a cane back then. But he was actually on a two-fight win streak. He was 33 years old. And after that fight with Volkanovski, he dropped down a weight class and continued to rake and get a ton of wins. Uh, wasn't the best Aldo, but it was a good win. And over a top 10 all-time fighter. For Teporia, it's like, yeah, he beat Volk, and that's excellent, but is a win over Max after Max gets beat up by Justin Gagey? Like, if he fights Max, that means Max probably moves back down. Why would Max move down? It would mean that he would have to lose to Justin Gagey. Ilya's win over Max wouldn't be as good as Volk's win over Max, for example, right? When Max was young, in his 20s, in his early 30s, it would still be an excellent win, but losing to Justin Gagey is the type of thing that can boot a guy right out of the top 15 all time because it's like Max is already kind of holding on to that 15-14 spot. If he loses, that kind of does matter all time, okay? And so I think that he needs to get a win over Yair, which would be a solid title defense. He needs to beat a guy like Evloev or maybe Arnold Allen. I think both of those guys are pretty damn even. Uh, a Sean O'Malley win, for example. If Sean O'Malley were to move up, that means he would probably beat Marab. Um, probably get past Cheeto, and that would be a freaking solid win to have as well. So, depending on the caliber of opponents, he could get it done with four, having four defenses, but I think it's more likely that he needs five, just because if he does get that max win, it's probably going to be like a softened up Max Holloway, older after a Justin Gagey beating, and it's, you know, again, if he rematches Volkanovski, the second win over Volk wouldn't be that amazing. I mean, sure, it's still Volk, but it gets less impressive if the guy's coming off of two KO losses and he's at the age of 35 as well, 36, whenever they fight next. So there's that. I do think that Ilya has more work to, to do. Absolutely. Um, it's very difficult to pass Volkanovsky quality-wise. I know some of you guys are going to be trolling me in the comments saying Lucas is just saying this because he's a Volk fan, but it is kind of true. Like, he doesn't have the, the, the same young goats in his division. This is why Volkanovsky, for example, has such a great resume. It's because he was fortunate enough to be fighting in big fights against guys like Max and Aldo when they were still young. Tapori is taking these guys on when they're getting older. It's not as impressive. And you can say, oh, Aldo was older. Aldo was 33 years old. Okay. Maybe Max will be 33. It's still going to be an excellent win. But Max isn't as high as Jose Aldo um, at the time that Tapori is going to be fighting him if he loses to Justin Gagey. Let's be honest. So let's get on to the next one. Middleweight GOAT, Anderson Silva. We are on to the middleweight division. 11 title wins. Again, if you're looking at this, I'm only counting middleweight. Anderson Silva has a couple of light heavyweight wins that happened during his freaking championship reign at middleweight. So I'm not counting those, obviously. Uh, total wins, 14 at 185. Again, the 16 fight win streak, part of that was light heavyweight. Total losses, seven. The good thing for Silva, because the ratio is not that good there, is that he didn't lose until he was 38. And that's kind of acceptable, to be honest. All right, his notable wins are over Vitor Belford, Dan Henderson, Damian Maya, Derek Bumson, Rich Franklin, and perhaps Chil Sonnen can be in the mix as well. I actually think Chil Sonnen's kind of underrated, but it's pretty decent. Pretty decent. Henderson was a beast back in the day. So was Vitor. And Damian Maya was pretty good. Rich Franklin at the time was pretty good. Derek Bumson, I mean, he got that win after he lost to Chris Weidman. So his dominance during his title reign was also insanely good. 
I mean, he was just knocking people out left and right, schooling guys, subbing guys even. And he's only had a couple of boring fights during that reign as well. So he's he's up there. He's up there. Definitely a top 10 all-time fighter. Current champion at middleweight, Drickus has a lot of work to do. Only one title win, and it's extremely close. There is an argument that he won, but there's also an even better argument possibly that it was a draw. So I'm a little bit iffy on that one, but it's still something that you could count as a win. Robert Whitaker. Robert Whitaker is one of the best middleweights of all time. I think that beating Robert Whitaker, for example, is better than anything Anderson Silva's ever done during his title run, okay? Whitaker has a better resume than Dan Henderson, Vitor Belfer, you name it, he has a better resume than all these guys. But it's only one guy. Strickland, modern day guy, former champion, even though he wasn't a dominant champion, that's an elite win. Darren Till, you're going to shit on the idea of Darren Till being a notable win? Um, are you trying to sit here and tell me that fucking Rich Franklin is so much better than Darren Till? That Derek Bumson is so much better than Darren Till? Derek Brunson is pretty alright. That's why I'm counting him. He's always been like a top 10 guy, but he's not like that far ahead. Um, and of course, he has Derek Brunson as well. Is Whitaker an all-time win? I can't put him as high as Holloway, but with that win over Paulo Costa, Whitaker keeps getting excellent wins, especially if you are someone that does believe that he beat Izzy in the rematch. That kind of makes his resume a lot better as well. Um, I don't think I'm ready to say that Whitaker's an all-time win yet, but he's getting close. It's very, very good. Uh, Drickus' dominance has been all right. He's undefeated at 185, which is sick. So what would he need to do to pass Anderson Silva? I think he needs four more wins, and that's going to shock you guys. But again, Drickus has seven wins right now in the modern era. Anderson Silva had 14 at middleweight, okay? If Drickus can beat Whitaker, which I said is a better win than any of Silva's, if he can add more to that, maybe another win over Sean Strickland, and maybe he can make it look more clear, a win over Adesanya, former middleweight champion that has a pretty good resume as well, a win over Hamzat Chemaev, who is undefeated, even though I think he went to a draw with the Usman, it would still be a good win, and maybe someone else as well, beating four more modern-day elite fighters would give him a record of 11-0. And I believe, again, we're only comparing middleweight, 11-0 for Drickus Duplessis would then be compared to 13-0 for Anderson Silva or 14-1 if you're going to count the Derek Brunson win and the record of 14-1, or it would be 14-2 at the time, actually, considering Silva would have lost twice to Weidman. 11-0 versus 14-2, especially if Drickus' level of competition makes up for the three less wins. I don't mind saying that Drickus Duplessis is the GOAT based on level of competition and beating guys like Izzy, Whitaker. Uh, I think that beating Izzy and Whitaker is basically better than beating, again, Vitor Belfer and Dan Henderson. And then, of course, if he beats Hamzat, if he gets another win over Strickland, if he beats someone else as well, who knows, maybe it'll be Anthony Hernandez. Maybe it'll be Bo Nickel. I mean, if he can get wins like that, four more, I think he can be the middleweight GOAT. Some of you guys aren't going to like it, but again, it's like, it's not all about fucking title wins. Anderson Silva was fighting for belts as soon as he got into the UFC after one win, dude. Whereas Drickus Duplessis needed six wins to even get a title shot. It's a little bit different. And one of his wins that wasn't even for a belt was against Robert Whitaker. It's not all about, is it a title win or not? So, yeah. On to the next one. Lightweight. Absolutely love this discussion because we are going to see some variety here. We're going to look at Habib. We're going to look at Islam, and we're going to look at Charles, because there's a little bit of a, a close race with Charles and Islam Makashev. But of course, let's discuss the lightweight GOAT right now. Habib Nurmagomedov, kind of holding on for dear life. He's on thin ice, uh, and that's just because he left too early. But he's got four title wins. Again, title wins don't really mean that much, right? On one hand, wannabe, wannabe hardcore fans will say, Oh, he's got, he's got to get 13 more defenses. But on the other hand, they'll say that a win over Ally Quinta doesn't mean anything. And I understand that a, will, a win over Ally Quinta ain't that great. Like, it's not that impressive at all. So I don't give a fuck if it's a title win. But four title wins. 13 total wins in the UFC. Zero losses. It's that undefeated thing that's very impressive. 100% win rate in the UFC. And as far as his notable wins go, 
He doesn't have any all-time wins, even though maybe when he defeated McGregor, you could have possibly made the argument that McGregor's in there. Right now, I don't think you can. But McGregor, Justin Gagey, and Dustin Poirier are all like top 40 all-time guys. They're very good wins. And McGregor's kind of up there, and Poirier's kind of up there, but they're not all-time wins. Still really good, though. Still really excellent. Uh, he has a win over Edson, RDA, uh, of course, Michael Johnson, Ally Quinta, but we're just getting less impressive there. And his dominance is really what's impressive. Uh, only three rounds he has lost throughout his whole career. So he is the lightweight GOAT, okay? Tied the record for defenses and competed in, you know, a much better division than other guys like, you know, BJ Penn or Benson Henderson or whatever. So how does Islam Makhshev's resume look? Well, he has three title wins and he has 14 total right off the bat. Very underrated resume. 14 total wins in the UFC. Habib has 13. Yes, we know Islam Makhshev has one loss. I totally understand it. But he also has a lot of notable wins. Alexander Volkanovsky twice. Okay, fair enough. The second fight, it wasn't the best version of Volk. Volk was never going to win that shit. He would have had to have like some fluky type of KO. But either way, it's still a win. I'm not going to count that so highly. But nonetheless, he has two over an all-time great. He has a win over Charles Oliveira. Dominant. Maybe not on the ground, on the feet. Dominance. Drew Dober. Now, you can sit here and tell me that Drew Dober is not a notable win. He is. All right? If Drew Dober was one of Anderson Silva's opponents, we, we would have been talking about him like that was one of Anderson's best wins ever. If you, would, if you were to just bulk up Drew Dober and put him in Anderson Silva's era and make him a middleweight. Drew Dober... Honestly, is kind of close to Edson Barboza. Now, you can tell me all you want about Edson Barboza, okay? Look at his resume. It's not as good as people make it out to be. Dan Hooker and Armand Sarikian. Now, of course, Armand was young, but at the same time, these are just okay wins. All-time wins, he has a win over Volk. Two wins over Volk. I kind of count that as like 1.5. But listen, if Charles beats Armand, I do believe that that will be bring Charles into the top 15 all time. And if Charles gets past Arman, Islam Makhshev's win over Charles ages even better. So it is kind of de going to depend on that. Uh, and his dominance has been very good, 93% win rate. And now we're going to look at Charles Oliveira's resume. Three title wins, 13 wins in total, similar to Habib. Two losses. Now, of course, he has a bunch of losses at featherweight. He has a bunch of wins at featherweight, but we're only looking at lightweight. Um, 13 wins a total at lightweight. Notable wins are over Dustin Poirier, Justin Gagey, Michael Chandler, Benil Dariush, Tony Ferguson. Did I say? Oh, shit. My bad. I have to edit this, guys. Uh, I added all of uh, Islam's wins here. Holy shit. Okay. So those are his notable wins. DP, Gagey, Chandler, Benil Dariush, Tony Ferguson. Again, people are going to crap on me for saying that, you know, Drew Dober's up there. But again, outside of these, I think Drew Dober's a better win than freaking Kevin Lee. All right. Like Charles wasn't beating the best levels of competition on that big win streak up until he fought. I know Kevin Lee was coming off of good win at the time, but kind of up until he fought for the fucking belt or Tony, I should say, because Tony was only coming off of one win, one loss. Um, but all time wins, none yet. Similar position to a guy like Habib. Similar position to a guy um, like, for example, who, who else was I talking about? I guess I, I, yeah, Habib. Similar position to Habib, Dustin Poirier, Justin Gagey, really excellent fighters, but they're not like top 15 all time. And the same thing with Tony. Tony was kind of old at the time, still had a good resume, but not top 15 all time. So Charles is up there. He's very close to Islam. But what does Islam need to do to pull ahead from Habib? Now, again, you can't talk about this without discussing Charles too. So just bear with me. What Islam Makhshev would have to do to become the lightweight GOAT is I think he would need one more win if it's over Charles, assuming that Charles would have to get a win over a guy like Arman, which would make Charles's resume better, which therefore would make Islam Makhshev's first win over Charles age even better. And then getting another win over Charles, I think that would do it. If it has nothing to do with Charles, let's say Armand gets past Charles, then I think he needs two more. Maybe Gagey and a guy like Armand, okay? Um, so that's kind of what it really depends on for Islam Makhachev. Again, if he beats Charles twice, 
and he also has wins over Volk. And he also has a bunch of like the regular wins that Habib would also have. Again, we're going to sit here and act like RDA was this unstoppable, invincible, you know, insurmountable guy. He was pretty good, but it's like RDA, how's that going to compete with two wins over Charles and two wins over Volkanovski? It's just not really going to, okay? So I think that if he beats Charles one more time or gets a win over Justin Gagey and someone else, maybe another win over Armand, he would be the lightweight GOAT. So there is that. Um, and what does Charles have to do to become the lightweight GOAT? He needs two consecutive wins as well. So he needs to beat Armand, which would put him in the top 15 of all time. But then if he beats Islam Akshev, I'd put him above Habib, honestly. Because he would avenge that loss. Islam's got a phenomenal resume right now. Underrated. And I think that makes him the lightweight GOAT. So yeah, I think that's it. He would have six elite wins then. A bunch of okay wins, uh, and stylistically, he would have harder fights than Habib had too. And that's another thing that I really have to say about Makhachev as well. Makhachev is facing harder stylistic matchups like Oliveira and Volkanovski when Volk was in his fucking prime. That's better than beating a bunch of guys like Gagey that have no ground game or Connor. You could talk about his takedown defense. It's just been kind of okay. These were like very one-dimensional strikers that Habib was facing. And Charles and Islam, they faced more well-rounded guys. So let's get on to the next division. Flyweight. We're going to discuss Demetrius Johnson. And let me just make this uh, a little bit smaller. So what would Demetrius Johnson have to do? Or not, what would he have to do? I'm sorry. Let's discuss his resume. 12 title wins, 18 total wins. And I am going to be counting 1FC. All right. Just because I think that, like, listen, they were giving Demetrius Johnson some pretty tough matchups. And some of the guys that he was facing in 1FC, as soon as he got there, before he eventually fought for the title and got KO'd, I think that those guys would probably be able to at least cut it in the UFC. And you could look at some of those early 1FC wins and kind of think of them as the same caliber of win you would get when you're starting your UFC career. Lower in the rankings. Okay? He has two losses, one draw. Again, I'm only counting flyweight. I'm not counting his bantamweight uh, career before he dropped down to the flyweight division in the UFC. And I know that 1FC has a different weight class, but they're just buffed up flyweights because of the hydration thing. So they have to be bumped up, but they're all flyweights. Notable wins, Henry Cejudo, 1-1. One one. I know the second fight was close, but I'm just going to have to say it. It's 1-1. One one. Um, Adriano Moraes, that's a good win. 2-1, and one. avenged the loss. Got a decision win in, in the trilogy. Got a KO in the second fight. John Dodson, Joseph Benavidez twice, and Kyoji Horiguchi, which is okay. They're pretty good. They're pretty good. Uh, and the other wins that he has, I mean, like Bugatinov and these types of guys, they're not that great, all right? All-time wins, I think that we could have said Henry Cejudo was up there. Again, one of the things that makes Henry Cejudo Someone that you could consider being a top 15 all-time fighter are his wins at bantamweight over Marais and also over Dominic Cruz. I think the Dominic Cruz win is something that you could toss away. Cruz was coming off of the couch and he had had like a three and a half year layoff. It's not very impressive. And Marlon Rice is okay, but it's like that doesn't help your legacy at flyweight. So I honestly don't think that Henry Sudo's career in my opinion, really helps his resume at flyweight. But either way, um, his recent losses kind of bump him out. If there was any question, his recent losses bump him out. And his title defenses in general, in my opinion, are not that great. Like beating a weight drain TJ wasn't that impressive. Cruz has a great resume, but it's like Cruz has pillow hands. He's the easiest guy to beat coming off of the couch. And Marlon Rice is just okay. It's an okay win, but it doesn't make you top 15 all time. But Demetrius Johnson's dominance was excellent. 91% win rate, uh, lost at the age of 32 to Henry and then didn't lose again until he was 35. We know there's like a lighter weight class curse. And he even avenged that loss that he had at 35 in 1FC. On to the next one, flyweight champion Alexandra Pantoja, two title wins, 11 total wins, which I'm more concerned with. Again, like a title win, it's not the end all be all, but it just means that you're fighting good competition in that fight. Uh, total loss is three. So he does have some L's, okay? He does have some L's. He lost to Figgy, for example. Um, he lost to Askar Askarov. But his notable wins are really solid. Brandon Moreno, he's got a win over him every single time they've fought. Three times, but I guess we can only count two since one of them was on 
like tough. Uh, Brandon Royval, he's got two wins over him. Solid fighter. Manel Cap, solid contender. He's got a win over him. Alex Perez as well. Solid win as well. So pretty decent, pretty decent. But it's like he's not been as dominant as DJ. Again, a fight with Manel Cap, it was a close fight. Uh, the fight that he had with Moreno last time was very close. Even the first fight was kind of close. Um, and of course, the Roy Val fights weren't so close. But I don't really consider him as dominant as DJ. So he has to do a lot of work. And for me, I think that would be four more consecutive title wins. As long as it's not just a bunch of rematches. Okay, now I know four more is going to make you... Roll your eyes if you're just looking at title wins. But look, 18 total wins for Demetrius Johnson. 11 total wins for Alexand Alexandra Pantoja, which means he would have 15 total wins. He'd be 15 and 3, and you could compare that to 18 and 2. But this is where it gets very interesting. Alexandra Pantoja, listen, I'm just going to say it how it is. His level of competition has been so much better than Demetrius Johnson. Outside of Cejudo, who DJ's 1 and 1 with... Outside of Adriano Moraes, Donson, Benavidez, Kiroji Huraguchi, all of his wins are just meh. They're not that good. Like, this guy was fighting guys that were coming off of tough after they got kicked out of the UFC for going on long loss streaks. Demetrius Johnson's level of competition was absolute garbage. It was. And that's why I'm not so interested in all of his title wins, because some of them are just, yeah, they're not even that good. I'm being honest. Like, they were legitimately over freaking nobodies. I still think Pantoja needs to do more. If he has six consecutive title wins, he's got a bunch of good names on there. Again, think about what he has right now. Brandon Moreno? Dude, Brandon Moreno would have had the exact same fucking run that Henry Cejudo did, arguably. Brandon Moreno, you don't think he would have chinned a weight train TJ Dillashaw? You don't think he would have been able to move up and beat up fucking Dominic Cruz coming off of the goddamn couch? You don't think he'd be able to get past Marlon Marais, who gasses the fuck out? I think he would. So I think the beating Brandon Moreno a couple times is solid. Again, what makes DJ's resume stand out so much is Henry Cejudo. And I don't even think Henry Cejudo is that amazing. I think he's overrated. He's still good, but he's kind of overrated. Now, I know he beat DJ. That was a really good moment, but he arguably didn't too. <laughs> so a lot of Demetrius Johnson's whole shtick is like he beat Henry. And he had a bunch of consecutive wins. But it's like, who was he fighting, man? I think Pintoja only needs six title wins in general. A record of 15 and three. I'm okay with that being, you know, better than DJ based on the level of competition. You may not like it, but it's just true. The modern day contenders are a lot better. So let's get on to the Bantamweight division. Dominic Cruz. Seven title wins. 14 wins in general. Very underrated resume. Okay, because he didn't lose aside from when he lost at 31 to Cody Garbrandt, which is not the best loss. But outside of that, this guy only lost to Cejudo coming off of the couch, which is literally like Volkanovsky taking a short notice fight with Islam Makhchev. Honestly, it may be even better for Cruz because he was coming off of a long layoff due to being injured and he has pillow hands. He just can't compete coming off of the couch with pillow hands against an explosive guy in his prime like Henry Cejudo. He just can't. He was never going to win that. You could, you could chuck that loss out. And then he lost a 37 to um, Cheeto Vera. Not a bad loss. 37 years old as a bantamweight. Pillow hands as well. He was doing well in that fight. He was coming off of a couple of wins too. This guy has a really good legacy. And he also has a win over Demetrius Johnson. Yes, DJ wasn't a flyweight at the time, so I'm not going to count that against him. We're on to the bantamweight division now. But for Cruz, that's a good win. And then his most notable wins, we're talking TJ Dillashaw, we're talking DJ, as I just mentioned, we're talking Joseph Benavidez, okay, and we're talking Uriah Faber as well, and he beat him twice, and he lost to Faber, but that loss was at 145, I'm not even counting that, so, yep, insanely good resume, Aljo, I don't think he came as close to passing this guy as people think, and surprise, surprise, I think Marab de Velashvili is closer to passing him up than Pip Squeak Mally. Okay. Now we are going to go over O'Malley's resume, but like the lightweight division where I compared Islam and Charles to Habib, I'm going to do Marab and O'Malley and compare them to uh, Dominic Cruz. Because I honestly think that Marab has the best legacy, I'm sorry, the, the best resume right now at Bantamweight. No title wins. I don't give a fuck. 
okay? Three of his wins are like championship level caliber wins anyway. Um, 10 total wins, which is good, and two total losses. All right, 10 and two, pretty damn good. He has an all-time win over Jose Aldo. Aldo was kind of old though, all right? That was Aldo's retirement fight, but he was still coming off of a three-fight win streak at the Bantamweight division, which was pretty freaking solid for Jose Aldo. Again, freaking Aldo fans claiming that he was washed up when he fought Max. <laughs> That's just crazy. Coming off of a three-fight win streak at the age of 35 in the Bantamweight division, like four and a half years after, he wasn't washed when he fought Max. Anyway, the win over Aldo was still good. It's still a top 10 all-time opponent. And then he has wins over Peter Yan. And of course, you could say O'Malley beat Piotr Jan too. Yeah, that was an arguably arguable robbery. Marab de Velashvili annihilated Peter Jan and 50-45 them. It wasn't close at all. He beat Jose Aldo 30-27. Boring, but still a clean win. You can't take down Jose Aldo. He outstruck Aldo, which is pretty good. Henry Cejudo, dog walked him. And sure, you can say that, that Henry is old, but Henry gave Aljamain Sterling a really close fight. And he's still good. Henry is still good. All right. Just because I say things like Henry is overrated resume-wise doesn't mean he's not a tough out, not a tough cookie. And Henry, Henry Sudo won the first round, and then he got dog-walked. That's a solid win. Marlon Marais, that's a notable win. Okay? And then John Dodson, pretty okay win. I think that Marab's resume is better than O'Malley, but we'll look at O'Malley's right now. One title win, seven total wins... Two losses, if you're going to count the Cheeto and the Yan loss. And to be honest, guys, I've rewatched that Yan fight recently. I don't think it could have gone either way. I think that Yan has a better argument for round one, round two than O'Malley. And you can even make an argument for round three. Okay? You can. But there was a cut for O'Malley. I still think Yan won. But he still lost to Cheeto. It wasn't like Rafael Fazeev blowing out his leg by throwing a kick that he's thrown 15,000 times. You know, his body couldn't hold up and he got flash knocked out on the ground with an elbow. So O'Malley has seven wins, two L's, arguably. And Marab has 10 wins and two L's. And his win over Yon was a whole lot better than O'Malley's. But O'Malley does have a win over Aljamain Sterling, which is excellent. And sure, okay, maybe you can count his win over Yon, but I still think that was a robbery. As far as all-time wins go, O'Malley just doesn't have them. All right. Dominance, he's pretty all right. The win over Jan wasn't dominant, but the win over Aljo was pretty decent. Lost the first round, though. But listen, the, the issue with O'Malley, guys, ultimately, is that outside of Jan and Aljo, again, we can't really count the Pedro Munoz fight because nothing happened. I mean, he literally fought the worst levels of competition you can even think of. Eddie Wineland, Thomas Almeida coming off of like four KO losses. Ricky Paiva, come on. Like, come on. It's not close. Uh, but for Marab, though, I think he needs three more. If he can go 13 and two, and he would have, like, again, better wins, better caliber wins than Dominic Cruz, I think you could call him the Bantamweight Goat. If he beats O'Malley, Sanhagen, and then someone like Umar or Song, he's literally the Bantamweight Goat. Honestly, I wouldn't even mind if you call this guy the Bantamweight Goat by just beating O'Malley and Sanhagen. Two more wins could get him there. Because, again, you have to think about it like this. O'Malley, Sanhagen, someone like Umar and Song combined with Peter Yan, with Henry Sudo, which is okay, and Jose Aldo, like, you could basically say he's the Bantamweight GOAT. For O'Malley, though, I think he needs, like, four more, okay? O'Malley, of course, he has to get past Cheeto. That's a decent win. Uh, not the best win, though. He, if he beats Marab, that'll be crazy. If he beats Sanhagen, that'll be crazy. And Umar or Song, three more elite wins... I think that um, you could maybe call him the the Bantamweight GOAT. And I don't really consider Cheeto to be an elite win, which is why I think he would need four more. So yeah, honestly, guys, again, I'm just taking into account that O'Malley has fought a bunch of cans and his only impressive win right now or only like notable win literally might be Aljamain Sterling if you think that he lost to Peter Yan. And I'm not just going to act like he beat Yan because I don't think he did. So... I would say three more if you're going to count the Yan win, four more if you're not. And he, he doesn't have good wins outside of those. So on to the next one, GSP, welterweight goat, 18 total wins. I'm not counting the Bisbing one. All right. 11 title wins in general, three losses. Now his notable wins are over Matt Hughes twice, Carlos Condit, BJ Penn, 
who he beat twice as well, Jake Shields, who was really good at the time, and Nick Diaz. Pretty decent, but are there any all-time wins? I honestly think Matt Hughes is no longer a top 15 fighter of all time, and yes, that can happen, all right? Like, people are going to eventually pass him up. Who has Matt Hughes really, really got passed, other than, like, GSP and sure he's got a couple of good wins too, but he's also, like, lost to BJ Penn as well, you know? So Matt Hughes is kind of holding on for dear life, and... I just don't think that his resume in general is top 15 caliber anymore. So I don't think it's an all-time win at this point for GSP. GSP's dominance, very good. 84% win rate. So he's got a pretty great resume. He's got a pretty great resume. And now let's look at the current welterweight champion, Leon Edwards, who does have all-time wins. He even has two of them. And again, the all-time wins are the most important, if you can't tell at this point. He beat Kamaru Usman twice. Now, I know he's 2-1 with Usman, but still, two wins against one, you've proven to be the better guy. Colby Covington, it's a notable win. I'm not going to act like it's an all-time win, but it's a notable win. RDA, same thing. Cowboy, question mark, eh. I think Colby and RDA are better than Cowboy. Uh, Vicente Luque, I guess maybe you could put that in there. Like, Leon has a very top-heavy resume, where it's kind of Kamaru... Yeah, RDA and Colby are right behind there, but not not that close. And then everyone else is kind of way below. But in total, he has 14 wins and two losses. And the dominance may not be so amazing, but the 86% win rate is pretty good. And what I think he needs to do in order to pass GSP, again, 14 wins compared to GSP's 18. And let's not act like GSP didn't lose a bunch of times in the beginning of his career. And I'm also counting the loss against Hendricks, because he lost to Hendricks, and take out of your mind the Michael Bisbing win, because it was at middleweight. I think that Leon needs to win three more consecutively. If he beats Bilal, I, listen, I know some people are just not going to be able to comprehend this again, but it's very obvious. Like, come on. It's not all about fucking title wins. I don't give a shit if Leon Edwards only would have six. Six title wins against 11. All right, but it's not just, okay, what's the title win? Who is GSP beating? Like, come on. If Leon Edwards gets past Bilal, who has a pretty good resume right now, if he gets past Shavkat, who is a fucking, you know, boogeyman right now, and Islam Makashev, assuming Islam Makashev does become the lightweight GOAT and then moves up, I'm calling him the freaking welterweight GOAT. Like, a win over Shavkat Rachmanov would literally be better than basically any of GSP's wins, as far as like how tough the competition is. A win over Islam Makhachev, that would absolutely shit on any of GSP's wins. I don't care if Islam's moving up. People act like lighter weight class guys don't end up doing well when they move up weight classes. They do. In fact, more often than not, do we see a champion move up and have success than the other way around, okay? And he already has wins over Kamaru Usman. And Kamaru Usman is better than any of GSP's wins too. So I don't want to hear none of that. Oh, he needs to pass some on title advances. It's not all about that. It's about caliber of opponent. All right. And three more would give Leon Edwards a record of what? 17 and two. Oh, oh, that's so different than 18 and three. Give me a fucking break. 18 and three versus 17 and two. And Leon's caliber win, high caliber wins are better than GSP's. I know I'm getting passionate right now, but I know that people are going to be disagreeing with me. Only three more. Yeah, only three more. Straight up. I'll freaking argue this to my grave. All right. By beating Islam, he would have had three all-time wins. Three all-time wins. Better than GSP zero. And again, that assumes that Islam would win a couple more times at a uh, lightweight. And then Bilal has a good resume. Like, GSP fighting Bilal, that would be one of GSP's hardest opponents he's ever faced in his entire fucking life. Whether you like Bilal or not, you have to admit Bilal is good. He might be boring. He's good. All right. And Shavkat, <laughs> Shavkat might, e might have even beat GSP. So there's that. Let's get on to heavyweight. Stipe! Six title wins, 14 total, and four total losses. 14 total wins, four losses. Uh, his notable wins are over Francis and Ganu, but they're one and one. You know, so that kind of matters. It's kind of like a, a clean slate, um, but it's still a good win over Francis. He beat Daniel Cormier twice. The third went over a very old DC, but still, 
let's not act like DC was a bum just because he was old. He has two wins over DC, lost one of those. Alistair Overeem was a good win at the time. JDS, even though Stipe's one and one with him, still a win. Uh, and Fabricio Verdum, Andre Orlovsky, who was actually on a really good win streak as well. And I, I actually rate the Andre Orlovsky win back then too. Let's not act like Andre, just because he had lost a few times up until that point, he wasn't a former champion and he wasn't still good. He was still good and he still is a former champ. All right. Uh, his best all-time win is over Daniel Cormier, who he's beat twice. I do consider DC a top 10 fighter all-time. Uh, as far as his dominance goes, 72% winning percentage is not that great. Uh, he lost at the age of 32 and 30, but then he didn't lose until he was 39. So pretty good resume for Stipe Miocic. Tom Aspinall, current heavyweight champ. All right. Now, the reason why I'm not bringing up John Jones is is because I just don't think Jones is going to stick around. So it's kind of pointless discussing Jones and what he has to do to be the heavyweight GOAT if I know he's going to retire after Stipe. There's no point. So I'm just going to talk about Tom Aspinall instead. And we'll talk about Jones when we get to light heavyweight. But Tom Aspinall right now has zero title wins. He has seven total wins. One loss to Curtis Blades, but that shit's fluky as hell, okay? That's more similar to the Rafael Faziv loss to Mateus Gamrot than it would be to the O'Malley loss against Cheeto Vera. It just is. All right, his notable wins are over Sergei Pavlovich, Alexander Volkov, Sergei Spivak, and uh, maybe Krafty Orlovsky. I guess you can kind of take him out of the mix if, if you think he's too old at this point, but he was on a four-fight win streak. Okay, fair enough, get rid of him. But still some good notable wins. Pavlovich, I mean, that's like a title caliber win. Alexander Volkov, honestly, Volkov's really good these days. And as far as his dominance, extreme. Like, he's not lost a single round throughout his whole career. And he's basically undefeated if you're going to remove the fluke. So, extremely dominant. What does Tom Aspinall need to do to become the next heavyweight GOAT? I think he needs three or four more wins. And... In order for him to get that, he would just need to beat guys like Cyril Ghosn, Jelton Almeida, Curtis Blades. Now, the reason, again, sometimes the gap kind of needs to be close when it comes to title wins in general, depending on how good uh, the caliber wins that Stipe has. So, like, for example, Stipe has all-time wins over DC. Tom Aspinall beating Cyril Ghosn is not beating an all-time great. Even though Ghosn is a modern-day guy with a really, really good resume... Um, it's not a, a, a win over an all-time great. So I would say more likely three. If he beats Cerro Gon, Jelton Almeida, and maybe avenges it, avenges his loss to Curtis Blades, I think that that would give him a record of 9-0 and or 10-0. and He would be extremely dominant, I'm imagining. And 9-0 and versus, for example, 14-4 and or 10-0 and versus 14-4. and So if Tom Aspinall were to have a 100% win record with better high caliber wins than Stipe, I think all he needs is, yeah, uh, three more for that to happen. Let's get on to the next one. Light heavyweight, John Jones, the light heavyweight GOAT. Uh, title wins, 13. Total wins, 19. Losses, I am going to count the Dominic Reyes fight as a loss, okay? I think it was an L, and I'm going to act and treat it like it was an L. Uh, notable wins, Daniel Cormier, which in my opinion is also an all-time win. That's a top 15 guy of all time. He beat Alexander Gustafsson twice. Vitor Belford, Glover Deshera, Lyoto Mishida, Shogun Rua, Ryan Bader, Tiago Santos, Rampage Jackson. Uh, the dominance when it comes to a 95% win rate with 20 fights in general is crazy. And losing against Reyes at 33 is not the best look, especially when he was like a heavier weight guy. 33 is not the best time to be losing to Dominic Reyes, but either way, he was a champ at 23, and that in and of itself is also very impressive. So let's compare him to the current light heavyweight champion, Alex Pereira. One title win, two total wins, but the caliber of opponent that he's facing right now is excellent, okay? Jan Blahovich, if that's your first ever light heavyweight win, that's pretty fucking good. Like, Jan Blahovich is better than Ryan Bader. And if you have a hard time with that statement that I just said, you are trying to be Mr. Hardcore. It's time to wake up, okay? Ryan Bader, don't compare him to Jan Blahovich. 
Uh, don't even compare Leo to Mishita to Jan Blahovic. I don't care if you have, you know, uh, rose-tinted glasses on for the past. Jan Blahovic was a champion too. He was a defending champion as well. And he's pretty freaking crafty and has a good resume. Yuri Prohaska, going into his fight with Alex Pereira, undefeated in the UFC, former champion. Um, and of course, Pereira's dominance... He's been okay, been pretty decent so far. Uh, had a close fight with Blahovic, but only lost one of those rounds. But he is undefeated. Not that hard when you've only had two. But again, caliber of opponents are good. Now, I say six, maybe we could say seven. But this is why I, I think that, you know, this is a good argument. Now, right off the bat, I do only think that Alex needs seven more wins to be the light heavyweight GOAT. And if you just look at that and compare it to Jones's 19, you're going to roll your eyes. I totally understand that. But again, these are the notable wins for John Jones. I'm not really counting Anthony Smith or anything like that. Uh, Leota Mishida, for example, if we are to compare him with a guy like Magomed Ankalaev or Jamal Hill, I just don't think that makes sense. I don't. I think that objectively, Magomed Ankalaev and Jamal Hill would basically be better than most of Jones's wins in general. Most of them, not all of them. But then if he were to beat Jamal Hill and Magomed Ankalaev, he then has to face four or five more difficult contenders. And in the modern era, once you're getting up there in age, I just think that that would be an insane resume. Like if Alex wins against Hill and then beats Magomed and Goliath, and then beats four or five more guys, you're going to be calling him the GOAT of the sport. So I don't think it's that crazy to consider Alex Pereira as the light heavyweight GOAT with that kind of resume. You know what I mean? Like, the quality would just be off the charts. Sure, he wouldn't necessarily have a win like Jones had over DC, but DC didn't really cement his legacy up until he beat, for example, Stipe and a couple of other guys at light heavyweight after he had initially lost to John Jones, right? When he fought Rumble and then he fought Gustafson. It was after he initially fought the Jones. So Jones's win over DC aged really well, but when he beat him for the first time, he wasn't a top 10 guy all time. And the same thing can be said again about Alex Pereira. If Pereira, for example, gets like four or five, I'm sorry, six or seven more title wins, one of those could age really well. One of those guys could go on to be like the next, you know, top five light heavyweight ever. And so I just have a feeling that considering it's the modern era, who's he going to be fighting? Magomed, Jamal. There's probably going to be some other killers th that are on the come up that'll come out of the woodwork soon. If he beats those guys, like I am going to call him the fucking light heavyweight goat. If he gets seven more. Okay. I know it sounds crazy. How could we say that nine and zero can compete with 19 and one? It's the same thing with like Anderson Silva and GSP. Like, we just have to talk about their best wins. And you know what? I am willing to shake off a, a couple of fucking can wins when it comes to comparing them to someone that has a ton of quality wins. All right. And what I'm ultimately saying is that Pereira's quality wins with a 9 0 record at light heavyweight, considering his first two would be over Yuri and Blahovich. I mean, I don't. I think that Jones would have a couple of quality wins that could compete with that, but that's kind of it, to be honest. I'm not looking at the Cyril Gaon fight at all because I do count that heavily for John Jones's resume. But um, yeah. Anyway, that's it for the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I'm sure that this is going to be a controversial one. But until next time.